You're listening to The Common Sense Show. If you've just started a new business, or if you're just thinking about it, this podcast is for you. Micah Logan has a stellar track record coaching small businesses to achieve six-figure revenue streams. The advice on this show is what has allowed him to have over 15 years of experience as an entrepreneur. Here is your host, Micah Logan. Hey, welcome to the Common Sense Show. And uh, Micah, before we get into our conversation today with Eric Brotman, um, I want to just remind you a little housekeeping that we have to do that don't forget to re- to um, go to, easy for me to say, don't forget to go to our business resources page that's at the Common Sense uh, Podcast.com forward slash resources so that you can see some of the resources that I have there. I mentioned this on every podcast because simply it's a great resource for you. If you're a small business owner, entrepreneur, you'll see Micah's library there. I have books that you can buy that I um, have read that will help you with scaling your business and growing your business or financial literacy. Those are books that I endorse. And um, in addition to that, I have other tools and resources that you can use for marketing your business, creating a better website, and making sure that you have proper branding happening in your business. It's all on the business resources page. It's at thecommonsensepodcast.com forward slash resources. And also, don't forget to subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube and hit that notification bell so you can get alerts when new conversations from the Common Sense Show come out and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Now that we've done that, I'm Michael Logan. This is The Common Sense Show. All right, welcome to The Common Sense Show. As I mentioned in our open, we have a special guest. We have Eric Brotman. This guy is full of personality and knowledge. Personality and knowledge. Personality first. That's the order we're going to do this? Okay. He's a Personality and knowledge. <laughs> He's the kind of guy that people say, you know what, you're a character, and he would be a character. Uh, but no, he he is uh, an expert. He is a CEO of BFG Financial Advisors, and he's also the author of and the host of the Don't Retire podcast. Um, although the book is entitled Don't Retire, Retire, Grow, right? Graduate. Graduate. Yes. Graduate. Graduate. Excuse me. Look, sh- um, no, sh- shameless plug. Don't retire. Shameless plug. Graduate. Don't retire, graduate. And the funny thing is I have it right in front of me and I still got it wrong um, because that's how I roll, I guess. Um, but, you know, I, I do have <laughs> I do have a question um, and kind of I where I want to start. But before we do so, Eric, can you just tell um, the folks watching and listening a little bit about yourself and your and your experience? And then I want to dig into your advice and uh, in the title of your book. Sure, sure. Um First of all, Mike, it's great to be here. This is, uh, I've been looking forward to this. We, I, I started a financial practice back in 1994, which makes me uh, an old guy. So uh, I got a bunch of years on you, my friend. Um, uh, so over the last 30 or so years, I have um, amassed a, not only a clientele, but built a, a company with, uh, with 21 full-time employees in multiple states. We, have, uh, we represent families, multi-generational families all over the country. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I was a startup. I was a startup that had to borrow from everywhere and bootstrap and go a year or two without making a nickel. And uh, and, and so I, I I think I earned my stripes by by hanging a shingle. And I actually did that back in 03. So I had started a practice. I worked for other firms and then I decided to take the entrepreneurial leap uh, in 2003, which I did. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm an English major and a psychology minor by background. Uh, actually, I was one class shy of a, of a minor. So if anyone's doing a transcript check, I, I graduated in three and a half years because it didn't make sense to pay a, a full semester's tuition to finish a minor. But at any rate, I'm almost a minor. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I use my English major all the time. I do a lot of writing and speaking and so forth. And I find that uh, my studies of late 18th century romantic poetry come in handy never. So I, I have that going for me as well. <laughs> It's almost like French dance theory, a degree in French dance theory. Uh, you know? That was going to be my next minor, but I didn't finish the first one. <laughs> so, like, what exactly are we going to use this? I told my daughter and my son, like, I have teenagers, so it's like, you know, you know, uh, we're not going down that road, guys. Uh-huh. Pick an actual, um, pick an actual, uh, actual career and and be the best at it. But, um, <clears throat> so 
the one one thing of the things I, I like about you and your website and what you offer, you know, you you have this thing about high quality everything that you offer, high quality advice, high quality offerings. Um, and you your approach seems really thoughtful um, when it comes to uh, finances, personal wealth, all that, all those things. How did you develop your approach towards finances and how you actually teach others about finance? You know, some of it, some of it was learned in a textbook, but most of it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I have all the acronyms after my name. It, it's kind of ridiculous when you look at it. It doesn't even go on the business card. It's like, you know, CFP, CHFC, CPWA, EIEIO. Right. Um, so that, that really is not particularly, uh, you know, you get your background, you get your education. But where you really, I think, build a voice is in working with with families, working with people, working with entrepreneurs and business owners and executives and professionals and uh, and and folks of every walk of life and really understanding and listening. Because folks will tell you their story and every single one of them is unique. Part of what I love about what I do is that if you're authentic, you can build real relationships and real conversations with people that are as intimate as medicine. I mean, it it is, um, it's a special way to make a living. I love what I'm doing, but, but moreover, I also know that every day of my life, I'm making a difference for people. And so we built a a platform and I say we, because I have multiple business partners. We have, we have a half dozen financial advisors here in the firm. We all work together. Um, and, uh, and so we all, our, our clients really get the opportunity to work with multiple advisors and a a deep team of people, uh, Mm -hmm. to help. So we have specialists in different areas, but, um, you know, we've developed a program that I think is unique in our space uh, and we call it financial planning for all. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the key to financial freedom begins with financial literacy. And if you don't know what you need to know to make basic financial decisions, you are subject to being preyed on um, or subject to making catastrophic decisions from which it's difficult to recover. So Um, We also know that high quality financial advice and objective financial advice on a fiduciary basis feels like it's only available to the ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to to flip that script a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, every American family needs some financial literacy, some financial guidance. Not everyone can or needs to pay for advice, but you have to make tools available. So we put a library of resources out together. It's, it's interesting. You were talking in the open about your resources for entrepreneurs. We have financial literacy resources, some of which are free and they're available on, the, on our website. And it's for people to take basic, um, basic financial literacy education online. Um, and it could be your middle or high school students. You got teenagers. You want them to learn about budgeting and some basic financial stuff. They could take our course. It's free. Um, mm-hmm. There's also... Um, there, there are also programs and books and workbooks that, that aren't free, but are very uh, inexpensive and therefore ex- accessible mm-hmm. so that even people who maybe can't afford to work with a financial professional or aren't really ready for that, they're not financially mature enough to be ready for that, they can still get some help. And it's better than your typical do it yourself or stuff. I had um, <clears throat> Dr. Amanda Barrientes on my podcast from NFA no effing around. Um, (laughs) She is a more of a mindset coach when it comes to money. And it was interesting to me in that conversation was what she was talking about when it comes to money blocks and how people have these different ideas about how they want to, should interact with money. And they, but they don't understand where their blocks are coming from. And do you think that now, you know, I, I guess fair to say, you know, financial literacy is about um, opportunity for education and financial literacy and being around people um, who, you know, are financially literate to some level. Um, so yeah, that's a part of it. But I think a, a, another part of it is, and it may be, and I wonder if you found this in speaking to families and individuals like you have, is it that people just don't want to deal with money? Is it, is it too much of a stressor for them to, to, to deal with? Why do you think that they are adverse to hands-on management? There are a lot of reasons, and it's a great question. Um, one of them is, and behavioral finance is now a, an industry in and of itself because there's a lot of baggage around money. 
Mm. Um, you know, we all grow up in households learning lessons about money, often the wrong lessons by watching our parents or our guardians. Sometimes it's watching our parents fight about money. Mm. I mean, the things that married couples fight about are money and kids. Yeah. Um, and so if you grow up watching your, your family either struggle financially or watching them pinch every penny and not live their lives because they're hoarding, or you have one parent who wants to spend and one parent who wants to save. And there's this constant yin yang, you know, uh, issue there, mm -hmm. but we grow up learning mostly bad habits from our parents. We learn nothing in school basically. Right. And then we marry somebody or have a relationship with somebody who also learned bad lessons and they're different bad lessons from his or her own family. And what you wind up is this hodgepodge of bad ideas yeah. Occasionally, there's some good ones. I'm, I'm not suggesting that everybody learns bad habits, but a lot of times you have to learn by by doing and most young people don't have an opportunity to do that. So um, I think there's baggage there. There's also incredible amounts of shame. Mm -hmm. People who are by any rational definition wealthy. Yeah, some of them feel poor, they think mm -hmm. they're going to run out of money They're They don't have an abundance mindset. They're afraid of the scarcity. Um, some people who are by all means wealthy people are embarrassed by that wealth and don't want anyone to know about it so they don't want to talk about it that's um, an interesting now that's an interesting paradox isn't it oh yeah and oh, and, oh yeah. and that's not something talk like talked about nearly as much as it probably should the the amount of people who are actually are wealthy who are actually ashamed to be wealthy or or feel like an outcast in society because of their wealth that's a weird paradox well and and there's a reason why a lot of lottery winners stay anonymous mm -hmm. because when you are, um, when you reach a certain level of wealth, particularly if it's sudden wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Not, right. I mean, if, if you've earned it over a 30 year career or business ownership, or you're going to treat it differently than if it falls in your lap by inheritance or lottery or something like that. But absolutely. But for people with sudden wealth, first of all, they're rarely in a position to know how to handle that mm. and bad decisions happen quickly, but they also, are ripe for what I'll refer to as predators and creditors. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is it, it damages your relationships with friends. If you feel like they always have their hand out or somebody's coming to tell you, Michael, you know, I, I, I don't have a washer and dryer. I can't do the laundry. I need some help. And now suddenly, because you're in that situation, like, am I supposed to go buy you a washer and dryer now? Because I can, is that the right is that how our relationship works now? And if so, is that why you're friends with me? And there's all of this stuff. Um, a lot of people don't want their kids to know that they're wealthy people. And they try to hide that a little bit because they don't want their kids to grow up without a work ethic. Right. You know, young people who grow up knowing I'm inheriting something from mom and dad are much more likely to have what I, I like to call Billy Madison syndrome. If you remember the Adam Sandler movie, yeah, um, oh, but, yeah. but it, but it, it it's, they don't feel the need to be industrious because they know it's going to fall in their lap or I don't really need to plan for that because eventually it's just going to be here. Right. And so people don't want to ruin their kids that way. Um, at the same time, there are other parents who don't want to discuss money with their kids because they're embarrassed that they haven't made more. Mm -hmm. And some of those people truly are struggling and are afraid to be a burden to their kids. Others are financially well off and still don't feel like they've amassed what they could like it was some scoreboard and they didn't put up enough points mm -hmm. and it, it's it's amazing how much of my role and how much of our job is behavioral and psychological and qualitative versus quantitative this is not a math problem and that's one reason why you know the robo advisors and such d don't strike me as a threat because a computer can build a portfolio for you, can do an analysis for you, can show you an income stream, it can do, but it doesn't know what it's like to lose a parent or to have a loved one ill or to, or to be unemployed for a period of time or right. to go through the things that human beings go through. There's mm -hmm. no empathy. There's no accountability. It's just gamified. Yeah. And I think people really need to talk. I'm not a therapist. I'm not licensed to be a therapist. I don't even pretend to be a therapist. And I certainly can't throw stones from my own glass house. Right. But what we can do is we can listen, we can empathize and we can strategize together and try and come up with the best way to handle these things. And that might mean communicating with loved ones. It might mean, you know, if you came to me and said, I'm concerned because my parents are getting older and I don't know how well taken care of they are, but I don't want to ask them about money. Cause I don't, 
want to make them uncomfortable or make them feel like I'm counting on an inheritance. There's so many reasons. Well, we can facilitate family summits and facilitate a conversation that is much more qualitative than quantitative. Mm -hmm. So that I can say, Mike is concerned that he, he wants to know who, who you've named as responsible parties and who's going to be responsible for things if you're in the hospital and who's going to talk to a doctor and where things are. Not how much money do you have, mom and dad? But, you know, I was, a, I was a guest on a podcast um, yesterday, and one of the things that the, the host asked me, um, so I own a, um, a local um, fitness uh, business, and I am also a franchisor. I franchised that concept um, less than 12 months ago. We're, in, huh? we're emerging franchisor. Um, and so he was asking me about that, but he was also asking me about um, about the economy and mm -hmm. about how I believe it worked. And, you know, I told them what nobody, well, you, you hear, so you hear the consumer confidence index come up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not as, not nearly as much as it probably should. And he's like, well, what do you think the economy is based on? I said, it's all about confidence. It's a, you know, it's a soft system. Really. There are, there are hard, um, there are hard and mathematical and economic reasons specifically mm -hmm. for how the engine of an economy works. Um, but there are the majority of, of this is really how people feel about how the economy works and where they are and what they have in their pocket and what they should spend. And you, if you zap a person's confidence, um, then you change you know, their confidence and the ability for them to feel either protected, um, you know, spending money, you know, saving it in the mattress versus investing it. Um, and, you know, for people who think um, a quack, the reality is, is that when investors don't feel confident, they don't invest. It's very simple. <laughs> when they feel confident, they invest, you know, and, um, you know, so, so this aspect of like almost emotional intelligence when it comes to money is very interesting because it's tied to so many aspects of life. If you're deeply religious, you may have heard that money was a sort of all evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that kind of lesson doesn't necessarily just up and vanish. Well, or you might be tithing. You know, right. there, there are folks who, who uh, religiously, literally uh, give 10% of their earned income mm -hmm. to, their, to their religious organization every year and feel like that's their duty and, and that's their responsibility. And Right. Sometimes that's a hardship for them, but they often believe that that is the source of uh, eventual true abundance. Um, and I suspect that's probably true to some extent. I mean, I think yeah. people who are generous and people who, who put themselves out there, not just financially, but in lots of ways, do reap benefits from that, and especially if that's not the reason they're doing it. Um, you know, right. altruism and so forth. But you raise a good point about the economy and about consumers. You know, about 70% of, of the U.S. economy is based on consumer spending. Um, I don't know how old a fellow you are, but if, if you remember 40, uh, I'll be big four Oh this year, Eric. Okay. So, so, well, happy birthday. I just turned 50. So I, I, I <laughs> cry me a river, um, but you remember nine 11 as a young adult. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was, I was um, getting ready for work that. that okay. Morning. So, so yeah. And all of us who live through that remember exactly yep. where we were and what the weather was and what the light, yeah, that was our big event for a generation. So mm -hmm. But if you'll recall, in the wake of 9-11, after we got over the initial shock of what happened and we did the and we, we dealt with the physical damage and the loss of life, one of the first things the president of the United States at the time did was go out and encourage people to buy cars. Mm -hmm. And all the various automotive companies put out 0% financing. Interesting. Now, the reason that happened was to make sure because the auto industry was such an important industry and such a measure of consumer confidence mm -hmm. that if people stopped buying cars, it was going to create an economic problem that was going to compound all of the other problems created by such a horrific event. Right. So one of the first things that happened was we've got this. We're going to make sure interest rates stay low for a long time. Go buy cars. Now, that was 20 years ago, which mm -hmm. is hard to believe more than that now, but, yeah. um, but those interest rates and that those conditions that began as a result of that stayed in place for the better part of two decades. Mm. Now, 
there's more to it because, of course, we went through the global financial crisis and we went through the credit piece. And we could talk all about that and how that impacted consumer behavior and, and the economy and markets and, and decision making. But the reality is that there was a, an immediate understanding that the American consumer was driving this ship. Right. And th the same thing is true when there are stimulus packages more in more, you know, more recent times where there's a significant loss of jobs and there's a need for there's a need or a perceived need to put uh, cash in people's pockets, which happened mm -hmm. repeatedly, not just with consumers and families, but also with small businesses that were kept operational and encouraged to keep employees on the payroll because the system it, it, it's fragile enough mm -hmm. that a jolt like a pandemic which is no small thing could really clobber some industries right and so oh, yeah. it can consumers had to spend and if they don't spend it's a problem so cheap money has made that really easy well if you've bought groceries or a gallon of gas lately you know that things aren't feeling cheap right now no, you're about 7% lighter in the wallet <laughs> as of just, just from December of, of 21. Yeah. And I, I don't know how this is going to play out. My crystal ball is fantastic, but it's broken and I can't get parts for it. So I, I can't tell you what's coming. It's what held can, up in the port of Hong Kong at the yeah, moment. Probably. Oh man. Yeah. That, <laughs> along with my, along with the oven, I can't get an oven. Yeah. I, exactly. We haven't been able to cook for three months. I'm losing weight, which I guess is good. Anyway. Um, the, 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 the fact is, that um, we don't know what's coming, but if inflation really does take hold and if the Fed starts raising interest rates, it's going to impact a lot of industries in a lot of ways. Mm. The biggest one, I think, being housing. And the reason that I say that is when money's cheap, your house becomes your piggy bank. And when you then throw in a pandemic where people are spending more time at home, instead of spending money on a vacation, they're spending money redoing a bathroom. Yeah. So your home gets more valuable and then there are bidding wars for houses. If that sounds anything like 2006 and seven, it is. The difference is that in 2006 and seven, credit was entirely too easy to come by. Right. People who couldn't qualify for a Discover card were getting 100% financing for new homes. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of reasons for that. And, that, and that, that waxes on the political, which I'll avoid. But at the end of the day, there were lots of reasons why that happened. And that's not being repeated now. Right. But housing prices can't continue to do what they're doing. And if, if people have borrowed money because it's been cheap against their homes and then prices drop again, I'm not suggesting we're going to see a, a financial crisis. I am suggesting there will be a lot less buying and selling of real estate, of personal, I'm not talking commercial, but personal real estate. And if that occurs, that's going to affect a lot of industries too, because that's the biggest purchase we make in our lives generally. You know, it's it's funny, um, and you're right about that. And look, I live in Massachusetts. I mean, you might as well be New York or California. Well, probably not California because California is just insane. They're 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 estimated, um, not to go tangential, but it will happen. Um, that you know that the average cost of a house in California is, is going to go from eight hundred thousand to eight fifty, mm -hmm. which is insane. Oh, yeah. um, as an average, yeah, it sure as is. an average um, in Massachusetts, the real estate market here is, it, you know, the average, the average house is selling for like a hundred grand over asking. You don't mm -hmm. even have to be a good real estate agent. Now you just have to have a pulse and a suit and, you know, <laughs> suit optional and you're, and you're killing it. You can wear a track suit. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You're right. And, and houses going over asking are problematic too, because you can't borrow yes. over appraisal. Right. So that means coming to the table with cash, which a lot of times means creating additional debt or putting other strain on other financial resources in order to get into a house. Now, right. as long as interest rates are low, money's still cheap. You can still finance that. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I bought my first, my first home um, in 1997. And I paid $91,500 for it. And I financed it at seven and a quarter, which was a great deal at the time. Yeah. The house I grew up in, in the eighties was new construction. We moved in 1982. Uh, it was financed at 14 and three quarters. Wow. That's like buying a house with a visa card. Yeah. Almost now, a retail card. 
Uh, yeah. And I don't know that. I, yeah. I'll put it on my Macy's account. I don't know <laughs> yeah. that that's, I don't know that that's coming our way. Right. But we have an entire generation who's never seen inflation before. You're on the cusp of it yourself. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're young enough to barely remember when things got more expensive, other than healthcare, education, and leisure, which always inflate by more than, than everything else. I'm in an odd place, Eric. I, they call, they call me, a, I'm either a geriatric millennial or I am called a, uh, I'm in the, just, a, just on the cusp of the previous, um, the previous generation. Well, listen, enough- as a proud, I'm a proud Gen Xer. Yeah. And, and we are so small, we could use your numbers. So please come our way. We're, we're recruiting from the, the old millennials. It is, it is an amazing thing. So the, so the, so the geriatric millennials or late Gen Xers, which kind of where I fall mm-hmm. in with my birthday, we're like, we just remember life before it turned into whatever this thing is now. Um, and, and here we are. And so we, we kind of can function in both and remember both, um, you know, but you're absolutely right. And, I wonder if it's these, I wonder if it's when these events happen because people don't really, so this is the education piece I think you were talking about earlier, which is that, do you know what happens when inflation goes up? The lack of knowledge of what happens when inflation goes up will affect almost every decision you make on a daily basis financially. And and your shock to that could cause you post-traumatic stress disorder. If it gets really bad, except we already all have that. Yo, so true. So I'm self-diagnosing right now. <laughs> yeah. In fact, this is this is an intervention for you today. Yeah, that's right. Um, you're right, and it's not just the education; it's the emotion of it, mm-hmm. because um, people tend to operate in herds and they tend to panic easily, and the pendulum s- tends to swing between greed and fear. Now you're in Massachusetts, where you guys can handle the snow. Yep. I don't know if you have a run on milk and toilet paper every time there's snow forecast like we do down in Maryland. No. But when I tell you, you cannot get milk or toilet paper when there's going to be snow. Now, first of all, I don't know how much snow we're talking about, but milk only lasts for so long. <laughs> right. Second of all, how much toilet paper are you going to need for three days? Mm-hmm. But it's this herd, this ridiculous thing that happens and people get strange when they know a storm is coming. Even this is, I'm not talking named storms that are going to change the landscape. I'm talking about a a regular event. Yeah. Well, financially, the same stuff happens. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if markets start to move adversely, whatever markets, there tends to be a stampede out at exactly the wrong time. (laughs) <laughs> and and if if we learned nothing from 2008 and 9 shame on us mm. now i know that gen z doesn't know what that felt like right and we can tell them stories but it's no more than my hearing stories about 1929 i, I can't identify with what that's like i hope i never do yeah but um but there was a mentality for for generations coming out of the great depression mm-hmm not only a scarcity mentality, but a need to hoard and a need to have physical currencies and physical. It was important to have physical metals and physical money. Yeah. Um, it, and it's interesting because now that we're not on the gold standard, the dollar bill is nothing more than a loan from the government. It's a promise to be worth something. That's right. And it's not tied to anything. Mm-hmm. So my dollar bill is only worth a dollar if you're willing to accept it for what you consider to be a dollar's worth of services. That's right. It's, well, Bitcoin. it's Bitcoin. They well, turn the, <laughs> they turn the dollar into a speculative currency. Maybe, although although I will say that that you know traditional currencies are spread out much more. Sure. When sure. you look at something like crypto, it is it is dramatically controlled by a tiny number of people and yeah. institutions. That's dangerous in and of itself. But 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 even traditional currency, it's only worth something if someone's willing to accept it. Right. If you're starving to death, my $10 bill is not going to feed you. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if, if currencies wind up having trouble and we've seen whether it's Zimbabwe or Venezuela or other parts of the world where currencies have failed, the, the Mexican peso at one point, they had to devalue it a thousand times. Unbelievable. Where uh, instead of a $1 bill or a one peso, it was a thousand. And they finally just cut three zeros off everything and called it the new peso. Unbelievable. Well, imagine if that happened. We're paying right now for cars more than our grandparents paid for homes. If that's mm-hmm. not inflation, even in a small way, 
I don't know what is. And so when you start thinking about financial independence, which ultimately is what this is about, it's getting to a point where work is optional and you've built enough of a nest egg to care for yourself for as long as you live with dignity. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, particularly for young people now, it projects into a massive number that looks ridiculous and impossible. And it's not ridiculous or impossible. It just requires a plan and a path and some discipline and some accountability. You know, you own some gyms. People don't suddenly, you know, get a gym membership and three days later look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday. That's not what happens. Right. It requires discipline. It requires time. You're not going to lose 50 pounds in one day unless it's surgery. Mm -hmm. So, wow. you know, if you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to get in shape or you're trying to build your endurance or physical health and financial health are really similar in terms of how, how they're required because most of it's invisible. Mm -hmm. We don't see our physical health. You're not checking your blood pressure every five minutes or your glucose level, unless you know there's an issue and you've got a monitor. But for most people, we don't check our personal data like that every day, our health data, but people look at their portfolios every morning, like they're supposed to do something. Yeah. It's, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. You know, the, the priorities of generations are, fascinating to me you know and you know i went to school for psychology ironically as well i huh. am a big yeah but you finished your degree for it <laughs> so <laughs> you're ahead big, of me yeah. i'm a big human behavior guy and i'm uh -huh. into social economics it's kind of like in, in business strategy that's that's kind of all i read mm -hmm. and um you know you know to me what's apparent is that this generation of late teens and young adults value homes and vehicles differently than past generations. And it's almost like they value vehicles more than homes because if I can get in a car and have an experience somewhere and, and it's very experiential now, these generations more so than kind of, and, and I think that's representative in how long people stay in their jobs now too, you know? So it's like, well, let me go experience these things, which is absolutely fine because quality of life is important. But quality of life when you're 23, I mean, what are we talking about here? You know, yeah. and then I was an article, I think, in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that I read that was talking about how this generation does not value home ownership um, in the same way as past generations, but they value um, flexibility and the ability to yep. uproot themselves yep. and move. Um, you know, it's almost like life liquidity you know, that's what they value more than anything else. I'm in total agreement with you. Although I think the pendulum's already started to swing again Interesting. because, because of remote work. Yeah. You okay. know, a, a post COVID world, or if there is such a thing, or at least when COVID is endemic and it's part of the conversation right. every year with your, your annual flu shot or whatever. Um, now it is possible to change jobs without moving. Mm -hmm. And so I actually think for people who say, I really want to live in Seattle, but I've got this job offer in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily, depending on what you do for a living, you don't necessarily have to move to take the job. And right. for, for, for business owners, it's a game changer because it means you can hire talent almost anywhere if you can have remote work. Mm -hmm. So uh, so your radius is no longer is no longer what traffic will allow. Right. And I don't know how close you are to Boston, but we're close enough in the Baltimore, Washington quarter to know what what traffic looks like and how hideous it can be. And you, you can waste so much time commuting or you can telecommute now in a lot of in a lot of cases. And, and people want flexibility. So you're right. They've always wanted this generation's always wanted flexibility to be able to pick up and move. But now you might not have to pick up and move. You don't have to go to Nashville because that's where the job is. If you want to be there, great. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you can live in Albuquerque and work in St. Louis. It, it, it really doesn't matter in about a third of American jobs. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be interesting to see if that continues or if there's a call back to the traditional office where everyone's working together. I know that we have 21 total people, three are remote and 18 are on site. Right. And our remote people who love working remotely also report feeling less attached, connected, and everything else to their coworkers. Well, of course they are. They're not at the water cooler talking about their weekend. Right. 
or or going to a go and grab lunch together. Yes. So I, I do think there's a social you talk about social psychology and social economics. There's a social aspect of collaborating by more than screen. Yep. But the combination of the flexibility to be able to pick up and move or even in a married couple or a, or a committed relationship, it used to be if, if one of them got a job offer, they might both have to move. One of them might have to give up their career or their job to do it. Right. That's less likely now, too, in a lot of cases in, in, in white collar and in office job type situations. So I, I think the jury is very much out on how the next generation of graduates I think college is going to change. It's already changing. It has to. First I mean, of how, all, how much more expensive can it get? Well, and, and what are you paying for? You know, Yale just went fully remote and is charging full tuition. I'd lose my mind if I was paying that. That is unbelievable. I mean, what are you getting? Is, is it real? Are you really just paying $300,000 for a piece of paper? Mm -hmm. Because you're no longer getting that experience. You're not collaborating. You're not building your network. You know, I was watching a documentary or a, maybe a, just a clip or something. It was on Peter Thiel. He, he created this foundation where he, if we're like, if, if, if a kid is graduating high school and they have an idea for a business and they want to be an entrepreneur, they can like apply and they can be a part of this academy, uh, entrepreneur academy. And he will give a hundred, he will give a hundred thousand dollars to help them build a business with skipping university. Mm -hmm. And there, there'll be a lot of people that listen to this who want to shoot guns and bazookas at me for saying that. But the reality is, is that I think we know enough now to know that there are other options out there. I mean, the fact that people talk about trade schools like they are, you know, second class programs and there is a chasm of a need mm -hmm. for tradespeople in this country and there's a chasm of a need for trades entrepreneurs. And oh, by the way, these companies, these trade companies are making millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. Could be some of your wealthiest clients um, that you see. And yet there's this, I'm not sure if it's just a long standing narrative about university and what it, and what it provides for you. But, you know, I think the conversation about, you know, income generation or wealth generation needs to change now that we have updated knowledge about how the world actually works. I think it's a form of classism. Mm. I, I think it's a form of egoism. Um, you know, you show me a kid who's making 80 or a hundred thousand dollars a year doing something creative, um, uh, whether it's entrepreneurship or whether it's a trade or what have you. Um, and I'll take that person next to the one who got the, the art history degree and is 300 grand in debt. You know, who's got the brighter future? I, I don't know for sure. And there's certainly some, there's some industries that require certain types of education, but Mike, sure. I think, I think education is now let's, let's focus on it as a lifetime journey of learning and growing, not this four year window. Why is it four years? <laughs> right. why, why isn't it three? Why isn't it five? Four right. is arbitrary. It's an economic reality of, schools that are, by the way, businesses and for profit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I understand the difference in the for profit versus the nonprofit schools, but they're building endowments and everything else. Um, it, it strikes me as you're not going to learn everything you need to know to do any job by 22 anyway. Right. So why are you why are you spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a piece of paper so you can go out in the world and earn a whole lot less than it costs you for that senior year of school? only to then realize that your job is obsolete in five years if you don't find a way to go back to school anyway. Right. Like, aren't we better off? Wouldn't we be better off if young people came out of high school and they, they either learned a trade or apprentice somewhere and maybe they were taking classes, but they weren't trying to graduate in four years. Maybe they were taking 10 or 12 and they were taking two courses at a time so they could also make a living and, and didn't dig themselves in a financial hole. Right, yeah. I mean, I don't sure. think it's just trade schools. I think it's, the four-year model is going to come under fire. It's unnecessary. I told you earlier that, that I graduated in three and a half years. <clears throat> I actually did two summers. And I did that partially because it was an economic reality. It was one less semester of tuition, which was a big deal right. even then. Yeah. And, and the second was I was in a hurry to go out and get a job and make money and, and be self-supporting. I wanted that at a younger age. Mm -hmm. 
So I did it in three and a half. Now that's not to suggest that I'm so wildly bright that I could do it fast. I took some mm -hmm. summer school, but, but I, I think this four year thing is a, it, it's, it's a myth, especially when yeah. you consider taking four classes at a time um, is barely full time. Yeah. That's not a full time job. You're right. going to be in for a rude awakening when you've got to, when you've got to be at a, a real 40 plus hour job. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, we're talking and, and so like, you know, we talk about financial planning, college tuition guts many years of income generation, many years because of how expensive it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, Obama, when he was president, what was he in his third year of his presidency before he paid off his student loans? Is that so, right? I did not know that, but that's I'm, yeah, something like that. He was he was he's doing okay paying, now. Yeah, yeah, he, he's, he, he's found abundance now. He's certainly doing okay. He's, yeah. he's managing himself quite uh, well on Mar Martha's Vineyard where they have the massive he, he, mansion yeah, he's now. Do, he's doing fine. Um, I, he hasn't invited me to any parties, by the way. Neither my, and, me either. Yeah, okay. I, I would I would feel like a uh, fish out of water at that kind of party, though. But. Uh, me too. <laughs> the, <laughs> All um, day. You know, but like he he had student loans as president in the, in the United States. It was, or maybe like the year before. It was something like it was. He was mm -hmm. he was certainly campaigning when he still has student loans, if not president. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if that doesn't wake you wake you up to some of this, stuff. and then the other piece too is there's chatter about suing these universities if a person can't get a job. Well, I I, I think that's that's I think what's called obfuscation. I believe that's that's when that when you have no facts, you try and you try and make something opaque so that so that uh, that you hide it. There's no there's no merit to that. Where, um, where's the, what's that, that that legal saying? If you have the facts, pound the facts. If you have the law, pound the law. If you have neither, pound the table. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, that and you're right. And and so that's that's to me that's foolishness. But there's no question that an entire generation was sold a bill of goods, that the only way to success in this country was a four year degree. Mm. And when college became this idea that it was for everyone, it made it useful for no one because it was no longer a differentiator in the right. 1950s. Not everybody finished high school. Mm -hmm. A high school diploma was what you needed for the, the, the better job. But some people were hitting the, the workforce before that they didn't all graduate. You fast forward to the to the 80s and now pretty much everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but the vast majority of, of folks got their high school degrees and a percentage went on to college. And then 20 years later, it, the percentage of people going to college ramped up so much that it watered down the value of college. There wasn't, a, it, it was, it's harder now to find a carpenter than an accountant. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're True. everywhere. And so, you know, you hear those studies about there's more kids in law school today than lawyers on the planet or something crazy. And it, it, you're just pumping out these, these degrees because they're cash cows for, for universities. Right. But they're not creating necessarily any abundance for, for individuals. Um, I, I really think we have to rethink the model. And, and I say that also being someone who helps families figure out how they're going to educate their kids. Post-slavery trades work was the primary way that blacks got money in this country. They would almost all, you know, first of all, they did, they worked in trades as slaves, but post-slavery, you needed specific, I mean, they weren't CEOs immediately post-slavery. So from post-slavery to the early night, to the early to, to, to mid 1900s, um, you know, blacks were majority trades people in the country, earned a tremendous amount of um, there was a big middle class, believe it or not. No, no, and, I do believe it. It was and, a big deal in the black community um, prior right. to the 1960s uh, war on poverty. And, um, you know, I say that to say that, uh, you know, yes, redlining happened and a lot of the stuff that eventually became outlawed in the U.S., but blacks still bought homes because they had a large middle class. In fact, there was an article on how African Americans saved GM. <laughs> um in cadillac um I, i'm i'm not surprised it, the 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 black middle class historically at least not just during my lifetime but even before my lifetime was one of the most stable middle classes in america yes 
we right now don't have much of a middle class of any race or any background. This country is, this country is quickly becoming a small number of haves and a huge number of have nots. Mm -hmm. And I'm no student of history, but if I'm not mistaken, that's how you wind up with guillotines in the street (laughs) and pitchforks and everything else. Like that never ends well. You're right. It it reminds me of uh, the Gini coefficient, which is uh, one of the ways that they measure, um, basically when there's people of differing incomes in neighboring towns, the Gini coefficient measures that difference in areas with like the higher, um, with higher disparities in neighboring towns tend to have more crime near the Mm. border because these people are coexisting in the same space and people get to see kind of what they have and what they don't have. And so like you get like this. And so the people that get hurt are the people in the middle in between that have more than the people in the neighboring town, but less than the people on the other side, but it still seems like a disparity. Um, well, it is a disparity, but it's a, an observed disparity because of how close they are geographically. And so that raises crime. And I, I find that that's, you know, it's just an interesting thought to think about how there's so many public schools closed across the country. Mm-hmm. So many buildings are sitting there that could be trade schools. You know, I, you know, I've thought about this high school experience. Mm-hmm. You talk about financial literacy. Why, why is there four, why is there even four years of straight classroom work in high school? How come there's not like six months of work in junior and senior year and six months of uh, classroom hours? It's a great question. Um, it, it's a loaded question because I think some of what happens in education, a lot of what happens in education is driven by politics and unions and, uh, and a lot of issues like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to come back to this sort of middle class thing if, if we can, sure. because it's, it's, I think it's fundamentally important to, to look at the last 70 years in this country and to look at in the 50s what, what a household, what a family of four needed to live well mm-hmm. was one full-time employee one parent working Mm full-time, one parent, and in the 50s, it was almost always the mom, but nonetheless, it was one parent working, one parent taking care of kids and making sure that they're in good, and it was a very, um, you know, it was leave it to beaver, father knows best kind of, yeah, sure, kind of day, yep, and you fast forward to a, a time where it then required in the, in the 80s, and especially the 90s, it really did require two incomes, Mm -hmm. to manage a middle-class household yes which meant you had latchkey kids which meant you had kids with after school or or with no with nothing to do or coming home to empty houses Mm -hmm. when you had both parents working today middle-class families can't even get by if each parent has one job somebody's doing a side hustle somewhere Mm -hmm. or you know they're they're doing something on the weekends or somebody's working two jobs just to make ends meet Mm -hmm that's impossible to sustain. It's not good for kids. It's not good for the next generation. It, you know, it's not good for, uh, it, it's not good for anyone mm-hmm. to have to do that just to pay your basic expenses. I'm not talking about trying to get ahead. It's one thing if you want to work three jobs because you want to get ahead and, and, and build some, some net worth and you want to be part of the fire movement and all of that kind of stuff, that's great. Mm-hmm. But just your basics, to maintain a roof over your head and a car, at least one for the household and to be able to feed and clothe your kids. If you can't get by with two full-time employees in the household, there's a problem. And I don't know how to identify where that problem started. Um, Some of it might be automation. We could blame the fact that some of the, the jobs were replaced by technology or other things. There's certainly some truth to that. Um, but I, I don't know what the answer is other than a change in how we educate and how we train. Because I don't know about you, but when, when I went to college, most of the majors today that are popular didn't exist. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, no. I, they, they've definitely like doubled over the years, doubled or tripled. Right. I mean, there was no cyber technology. There was, you know, cybersecurity. There was no, there was no internet. I went to school before email for crying out loud. Me too. I had, I, so I had senior year. I had, I still had typewriter class. There you go. Oh my gosh. All right. Well then I feel better. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the reality is uh, two old guys talking to shop. Um, the, the reality is that there's, 
<laughs> there's a disconnect between what we're teaching and the jobs that, that are in the future. Ten mm -hmm. years from now, there will be jobs that don't exist today that kids today in school will already be obsolete and not prepared for. It could be hovercraft maintenance for crying out loud. I don't know what it's going to be. There'll be innovation and there'll be um, new technology and there'll be new opportunity. Uh, you know, you just look at what Tesla has done, for example, to change, to change arguably potentially to change the world from a, from a, a vehicle standpoint, transportation standpoint. But there's, there are other examples of that. What Apple did, you know, that, that, that was no accident. IBM right. could have been Apple, but they said, there is no way people are going to want a computer on their own desk. That's crazy. Let's not do that. We'll do big mainframes. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. So, so we have to change the way we educate. We certainly can't. The student loans are an abomination. That does not mean, I think, that we should suddenly just pay them off for everybody. I think if you borrow money, there's a responsibility to pay it back. Absolutely. But some of these young people did borrow money with the idea that this was some kind of guarantee for their future, almost like the people in 2007 got mortgages that were 110% that were negative amortization with the promise that home values only go up and they'll refinance in a few years. Right. Some of it, some of it is spin. Sell on the dream. Some of it is spin. And this idea that without a degree, you're less than somebody with a degree is nonsense. So uh, going back to the, your, your point about two uh, middle-class families where there are two people not making it, or just making it with full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. What's the psychological effect on even doing something like financial planning? Is it that they feel so stretched in your, in your opinion? Um, or they feel like they're not even in a, because of how little is left over, they feel like they're not even in a, in a position to financial plan. How do you work around? How do you work around that thought? And let them know that it's actually more important to plan when you actually, close I actually to the think edge. some, some of that, it's a great question. I actually think some of that has to do with demographics and some of it has to do with, um, with perceptions mm -hmm. because, um, you know, we, we have a, a young up and coming financial advisor in our firm, African-American who, who I met because he was a keynote speaker at his university at a, a scholarship event. Right. And we have a scholarship at that university. And so we were there to, to, to meet some of these young people. And he told me, and I thought it was interesting that he would try and he was a, 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 a captain on the football team. Great, great young guy. Right. And he, he would try and get his friends slash teammates to come to these campus, these events, these uh, career fairs or these uh, talks by various financial companies. And he said he couldn't get any of them to come because they all said, that's not for me. That's not for us. Mm. That's deep. And there's something more to it than, right. um, you know, in a, in a school that is 60% white mm -hmm. to go into a room when Merrill Lynch or somebody's out there recruiting and it's 98% white, there's something to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think underserved communities as a whole are less likely to seek out financial advice, A, because they didn't learn it from their parents. B, because there's so few people who look like them who do that work that it feels like it's not for, for them. And I, I say us and them, I, I don't mean to, to sound that way, but ultimately, you mean. ultimately people feel like th that's not for me. Right. And to, to, to change that language is not instant. Right. I, I, to me, that is not something that just you, a switch doesn't just flip. There's, there's thoughts that, um, that was Martin Luther King's had he not been murdered. Um, that was the next phase of his movement. So first it was passing civil rights and mm -hmm. creating opportunity. And then the next phase was silver rights, basically, you know, um, you know, creating, um, creating economic opportunity mm -hmm. um, to, to move, you know, Obviously, when there's a big Mac, black middle class in America, or a big middle class of any group in America, mm -hmm. then wealth in general goes up, standards of living go up, everything goes up. I mean, correct. If if people people are insane if they don't think that there shouldn't be a bigger, um, more broad middle class because fundamentally, um, it makes innovation better, the next generation better. Um, and, and everyone typically benefits from that. And, mm -hmm. and, and it even has an effect on 
crime and marriage rates, divorce rates. There's a lot of things that change um, when yep. the middle class is stronger. Um, so that's an interesting point. And, and I'm not surprised that his friends wouldn't show up. And But this is a standard that even professional sports leagues have adopted, which is you come in and do a NFL rookie symposium and they require you to take financial literacy classes as a, a NFL rookie because of, you know, the, um, I hate to use the word pandemic, but of, of players who go broken two years. Oh, well, a lot of them do because the careers are so short, but it's interesting because I, I looked at that program thinking, you know, I, at one point we represented one of the agents actually. Mm. And, and he said, you want nothing to do with this program. Wow. And I said, really? Why? He said, well, there's so many reasons. He said, but the, the biggest one is that the NFL is controlling the content in such a way and they're charging, they're charging advisors for the right to play. <laughs> okay. And he says, you almost need a separate license just to work. You do just to work with that for them to support you. You have to go through this process and it's partly licensure and it's partly a money grab and it's not expensive but conceptually it's uncomfortable. Right. And then he said, most, most of the, most of the audience is not actually, they're not actually the ones who you're going to want as clients because it's such a small minority in the, in that population, in the, in the professional athlete population in general, that actually builds sustainable wealth. Most of them spend almost every penny and aren't going to take your advice. And you're going to put a plan in and then they're going to withdraw a hundred grand a pop over and over and over again, because that's just right. what happened. He said, you, it is a phenomenon. I mean, and, and that comes back to where we started, where you start talking about wealth. If you're that one kid who got out of that high school and made $10 million, mm -hmm. you got four years worth of teammates who didn't. Right. And that's where you wind up with an entourage, mm -hmm. which are really in most cases, just clingers on. Right. And, and, and then you're keeping up with the Joneses and you're supporting your, your, I mean, I hear a lot about a lot of pro athletes who the first thing they do is um, they buy their mama house. Yeah. Well, that's an investment. First of all, their moms almost surely are the reason why they're able to be where they <laughs> right. are. And, and I, I don't You're question enough. that at all. Take care <laughs> right. of mom. I get that. That's so right. I think that's, I think that's a great thing. Right. But the ones who go out and buy seven cars aren't doing themselves any favors. That's right. And um, and and the Rolex watches and the uh, uh, and the ones throwing bags of money around strip clubs, that's not helping much either. So no. it, it is it is amazing how few really become the role models. And I think LeBron James has done that. I think Peyton Manning has done that. There are certain athletes, high profile athletes who have really done those kinds oh, of yeah. things. But so many don't. Mm. And it's 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 amazing. And. I think it goes back to your, your um, not necessarily your theory, but your topic about instant wealth and its negative effects on human psychology. Mm -hmm. And because you have this immense pressure that you, you talked about earlier when you were saying, talk about instant wealth, how all of a sudden people's washing and dryers break. And we've never really ever had conversations about me providing you with materially anything. And now mm -hmm. we're having these conversations out of nowhere. Um, and, and there's, it's funny because there's like, you talk about paradoxes is thought that your NFL career will last forever when you're in it, because right. I'll just practice and perform. Mm -hmm. But then you get cut because the coach changed their or, style or of defense. hurt or, or hurt. hurt. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's the, the vast majority of pro athletes don't make obscene money. Mm -hmm. I think baseball is an exception where some of these guys make, uh, but even then to make the majors, you have to be a tiny percent of a tiny percent of a tiny percent. That's right. One percent of one percent of one percent. Yes. yes. So, th but that's no different than entertainers. Right. You know, the, the big name entertainers are making a fortune. Most people are playing street corners or small bars <laughs> yeah. and, and, and working for tips. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So, yeah. so. Yes, there's this extreme piece. Like most people don't go to Broadway to act because they want to make money. They want to be actors. They're not necessarily going to be the next, you know, Denzel Washington and wind up on, on the big screen. So 
when you look at the average, if the average NFL player makes what, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year, the average, I, and I don't mean the mean because you have to take out those huge contracts where it skews exactly. the data. Yep. But if you look at the, the typical NFL player, the average career, I think, is three years. Yep. And so even if they're making five hundred thousand dollars a year for three years. That's not a lifetime of wealth. First of all, they get taxed like crazy for those three years. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they then have to find other ways to sustain themselves, and they're not all going to be doing commercials. Right. That's right. You know, they're not all going to have a line of sportswear. Right. And they haven't paid their agent yet either. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so, so I would rather be that carpenter making a hundred grand a year for forty years. Yeah then maybe the ball player making 500,000 a year for three years mm -hmm. because it allows for ongoing abundance and a, a steady stream of opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm not saying young people shouldn't chase their dreams. And if you have talent and you want to go, go for it, that's great. Right. But have a fallback. The, the, the young people, I love the NFL players who come out early yeah. and then finish their degrees in the off season. Yeah. Yeah. That's you awesome. know, you hear, you hear about that is smart. Yeah, you better have a plan B because this won't be forever. There are a couple of players in like the NHL who are 40 mm -hmm. who are still playing hockey. Most of them don't. And, and in hockey, yeah. it's different than, than some of the other sports, especially football, where football, you actually have to have, um, you have to at least have your high school diploma and you have to play college ball. And I think in the NBA, don't you have to do a year or two of college before you're allowed to be drafted? You do now. Yeah. You have to be 18 plus one year of school. Okay. So, so hockey players get drafted at 16, some of them and play major juniors. A lot of them don't finish high school. There oh, is wow. no backup plan, mm. you know, and they're going to get their bell rung too. And they're going to realize that the very small number make big money and they're on magazine covers. And most of them, most of them wind up with a limp, and a bill to pay. Right. That's funny. I want to address two groups. Yeah. I, I just want to get your take on two groups in particular. Yeah. So, and, and, and they're, and they're not racial groups, they're age groups. And so, mm -hmm. um, I like you to talk about teens. Mm -hmm. Like I have teenage. And so one of the things I do is, so Fidelity has this wonderful program now where they they're allowing, you know, teenage investors, right. They have this mm -hmm. kids program. Um, and then I want you to address people who are 10 years out from retirement, five mm -hmm. to 10 years out from retirement, um, because of the, clearly two different groups. Um, um, I would say people like me who are still in a pretty decent spot. I'm 39 going on 40, um, but I am also starting to get anxiety. Is it enough? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of working life left, had a lot of working life that's passed. Mm -hmm. you no, know, there's, there is anxiety, there's anxiety between yeah. here and the finish line. Uh -huh. Um, and if you want to touch on that, you can, but I just like to get your group on, on the major and the three major, uh, uh -huh. human, human groups, I would say. Okay. Um, starting with young people, my daughter's 12. So yeah. we're, we're, you know, I started later than you apparently, but, um, <laughs> but, but uh, with, with young people, it's to me, it's really about uh, trying to coach slash mentor towards not necessarily career focused, not at 12 or 13 or 14, but this idea of independence mm. because they're longing for independence psychologically and socially and in every other way. Right. And a lot of times they are, uh, they, they put their cart a little ahead of their horse and think they're ready for things. They're not. And there's a rude <laughs> awakening at some yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not speaking from personal experience, of course. Um, but when you, when you look at that group, having some sense, it's almost impossible for them to have a sense of the value of a dollar. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Um, particularly if you're of means, right? Because th there are certainly kids who understand that they might not get new sneakers every year, mm -hmm. you know, and for those kids, they, they absolutely understand not only the value of a dollar and the value of hard work, but how to appreciate what others might take for granted. Mm -hmm. But for upper middle, upper middle class individuals where money is, I'm not saying it's, it's pouring in and nobody has to think about it. I'm saying nobody's going without. Right. And in those situations, it's very tough when a kid has never really heard no mm -hmm. um, to then wake up one day and hear no. And, and they're not hearing no anywhere. 
They're not hearing it in school. They're not hearing it on the playing field. They're not hearing it in their religious organizations. Right. They're, they're the customer. They're always right. And mm -hmm. my gosh, they're all special and perfect. And they're all winners. Everybody got a trophy. Everybody. And uh, the last place trophy. I mean, if it's, if it's all about finishing, I, I like that. But at some point, you got to know how to win and you got to know how to lose and you have to know how to fail. Mm -hmm. The best path to success is having a couple of failures and dusting yourself off. If everything comes naturally to you, what are you going to do when you're suddenly 35 and you run into something you can't handle? Mm. You got to know small age appropriate adversities in order to deal with bigger age appropriate adversities. And if you've been completely insulated from the world and from real life, financially or otherwise, you're unprepared. It's kind of like if you live in a bubble because you're afraid of the small germ, mm -hmm. when you run into a big germ, you're done for. Yeah. All right. Not that I want to talk about the germs, but <laughs> um, th let's shift gears to the folks who are, who are older because, um, oh, and, and before I move on, the teenagers have to be involved in the decision-making around college and the financial impact of it. Most of them uh, assume that, ah, this will be, I'll have my whole life to pay this back. Being coached out of large, unfortunate student loans is a big deal. And parents need to be on it because schools don't have the ability to do that. And the yeah. colleges are selling. Yeah, that's right. Way to see our cafeteria. We have the best pizza in the county. Great. Right. Um, and and you, just a quick question yeah. on that. Uh, in, investment skills, index funds for kids or teens, are, are those um, just kind of getting started early? Um, I, actually getting think, I actually think the blocking and tackling of of budgeting and, and cash flow management is more important than investing at that stage. Interesting. Okay. Um, you know, I think as soon as a kid has a job, understanding how a Roth IRA works makes sense. Yeah. You know, even if mom and dad put the money in, it, it winds up being the kind of thing that will generate some, some, uh, some growth potentially and, and kids can play a role. Mm -hmm. um, we had a client once, this is a fun story. We had a client once who, who, whose kid had received gifts over the years and had I don't know, maybe $5,000 and they wanted to open an account for him. And he was in high school mm -hmm. and he wanted to do the research and pick some stocks and do it himself. <laughs> and so we talked him into taking half of the money and putting it in a, a basic index, a stock index, and the other half, he could do anything he wanted with. Within about a year, he decided he wasn't picking stocks anymore. <laughs> now everything is, he, he goes, all right, I get it. Like mm -hmm. he learned a really good lesson on what was right. $200 probably, but he learned it and I hope it, it, it serves him for a lifetime. Um, mm. So, so let's, let's shift to these folks five to 10 years out. Yeah. Because that's where the real anxiety is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you've done a good job when 2008 hit, the people who were 75, who had done a good job, we're okay. Mm -hmm. And the people who were 35, it was the greatest opportunity of a generation. But the people who were five years from retirement suddenly realized they're working an extra eight years. They can't afford to retire anymore. The anxiety comes when you have to figure out what life is going to look like potentially without a paycheck. That's a very scary thing. And the, and the scarier thing is when you're young and you hit a road bump, um, it, it, a financial bump in the road and you have to come up with $5,000 for something and it hurts you. And maybe you're on visa for six months or whatever it is. You do have time to recover. And if you run into a speed bump, you always have more time. When you're older, if you run into a bad market, when you're older, you don't have that time to earn your earning potential is highest when you're younger and you're and your earned income, usually between, say, 45 and 60 is the highest. Right. So I'm pleased to say I'm there. That's awesome. <laughs> You'll get there. Like, these are the peak earning years are 45 to 60. This I can see where... myself. You know, it's funny and not to cut you off here, but like, yeah. it's funny because it's amazing how income goes in stages and how it actually works. Yeah. Um, you know, I started young, really young um, with the business and everything. But now I'm 39 going on 40. And, you know, I still have income growth to do, oh, yeah. but I can see it trending in that direction. And part of the anxiety is not just, um, you know, you know, the, 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 where to put it, all this other stuff and all that. It's more like, man, I, you know, it's coming. What do I do with it? How do I manage mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I, you know, you just don't want to make a mistake. Like once you hit 40 mm -hmm. and beyond, you're like, okay, 
you can make mistakes, but you want to limit them and they, they should be far and few, few and far between. And, um, you know, so I, I think about that. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah. well, let me just, let me just, let me just deal with this, you know? And, 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 um, for me at this point, I've talked to my wife, I've been in business for so long now that I'm just, my head is continually going to, okay, it was that starting up and ramping up. Now it's escalating to exit and then mm -hmm. management. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's literally where my head every day, my mm -hmm. head is spinning around this, this mm -hmm. thing. So it's funny. I think about what you say about 45 to 60 and earn income. It's so true because you have this yeah. unique period of time when you can, it's like, okay, well, let me just focus on, uh, on, on, on earning as, you know, I can almost demand it, depending on how much your expertise is. I can almost demand what I want in this career or mm -hmm. in this business. Let me, let me make sure that I'm getting that every time and apply it appropriately. You're right. That is exactly what happens. And then there will come a point where you're like, you know what? I don't want to work this hard anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's not lazy. It's right. not like, oh, I made it. And, and you used the word finish line earlier. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage people not to have a finish line. Mm -hmm. I think retirement should not be the end. It should be the beginning. Mm -hmm. And Don't Retire, Graduate, both the show and the book, are designed to create a new uh, way of looking at retirement as a graduation to the next phase of life. It's not the end of anything. Yeah. So to me, retirement is not the absence of work. It's the absence of needing to work. It's hitting financial independence and then doing what you love, whether it's for money or not. Yeah. You know, when, the, when, when you don't need to earn money to be okay, right? you might find yourself making more then than you are now because you're not worried about it. The anxiety can hold you back. Yeah. You know, you don't, you know when you're concerned that this next decision could make or break you, you're going to tiptoe around it. If you say, look, this is either going to be super abundant or just abundant, you're going to make it more freely. Mm -hmm. But the folks who are within that five to 10 year window you talked about, they are in the scariest place of all because they don't necessarily have time to continue to earn at that level. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's finite. Yeah. Um, a lot of times retirement doesn't from, from traditional work doesn't happen because somebody wants to. It happens because of something in their lives. It could be that they have to take care of an aging parent. It could be that they get injured. It could be that they're just not healthy enough to do what they do. I mean, there, there are reasons why people quit work. And a lot of them aren't because they felt like getting the gold watch and, and, and being done. Um, but we spend 40 or 50 years of our lives, Micah, figuring out how to build the mountain chart. We've That's all right. seen them. Every computer's got them. Mm -hmm. You put in X dollars a month for this many years and you get this percent and look at this thing. Da, 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 da. What we never do in that 50 years is figure out now, what do I do with this mound? Mm -hmm. How do I create income? How do I make sure I don't outlive it? You know, it's one thing to plant lots of trees. It's a whole nother thing to have to decide, am I picking fruit or chopping branches off? Mm. And so when people start to convert from accumulation to income planning, distribution, preservation, they've never done it before. Right. And they've never seen it done. They didn't watch their parents do it, at least in our cases, because most of our parents still had pensions. Right. Oh, yeah. There's no pension now. Social Security, right now, half of this country, Social Security is their primary source of income. Unbelievable. That's scary. It is. That is, um, it is and, unbelievable. Yeah. You know, it's half. And the checks that these people are living off of are insane. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's true. And so it's important to figure out not only how much wealth you've built, but how do you use it? How do you not have the need for money beyond your uh, ability to take oxygen? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because uh, it's been said that to be young and broke is an inconvenience, but to be old and broke is a tragedy. Yeah. And, and it's true. Yeah. To be young and broke means maybe you're not getting the, you know, you're, you're not supersizing it, but right. to be old and broke means what am I giving up? What am I not doing? What am I? So those folks have to get, in my opinion, have to get professional advice. Mm -hmm. They have to have tax advice mm -hmm. because a dollar is not always a dollar. Right. A dollar in your IRA is not the same as a dollar in your piggy bank. That's right. Because the dollar in your IRA hasn't been taxed yet. It has a mortgage on it known as federal and potentially state income tax. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't know about you, but where tax rates are today, when you consider the national debt, you consider the, the various uh, programs, social programs, and you consider where we are as a country, tax rates aren't going to get any lower. Right. They might stay the same, mm -hmm. but I submit to you they're likely to be higher, which means most of us have a growing mortgage on our dollar. Right. Not only in terms of what it's worth because of inflation, but also because of the percentage that's going to go to the government because the government is literally broke. Yeah. We're deficit spending nine out of every 10 years. Last time we had a surplus, I think, was under Clinton. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it, I, it, I, yeah, I think I heard that. Yeah, I think we're printing money to yeah. pay bills, which is great, except that it makes every dollar worth less. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So you could double the number of dollars in your wallet, but if each one's worth 50 cents, you haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the folks that are really in trouble. Now, for, for, for those folks, they've got to get professional help, tax mm -hmm. help, legal help, estate mm -hmm. planning, um, financial planning. Yep. They need someone to help them make what is potentially a series of the biggest decisions they'll ever make financially. What are the big decisions yep. we make financially in life? The first one, is where to go to get education and do we take student loans? Mm -hmm. We're confronted with that before we're old enough to have a Budweiser. Mm -hmm. Then your next big decision is usually, am I buying a house or not? And if so, what kind and how am I going to do it? Those right. are big financial decisions. Mm -hmm. The when to stop my paycheck and how am I going to live without it decision is infinitely larger than those. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, there's no mulligan. If you're lucky enough right. to have a pension, you're going to make that election on survivorship and decide how, how to get it and when to start it. And you can't undo it. Right. Social security no longer allows you to take mulligans. Basically, once you've decided that ship sailed, you got to live with your decision for the rest of time. Yeah. So if you've got decisions, you can't undo, you better make them right. And that's why those people need help more than anyone. And, and the people who seek us out, um, the, the families that come to us, most of them are sandwich generation families. They are 45 to 60 or 40 to 60. Mm -hmm. They got parents getting older. They're worried about yep. sometimes they're worried about them medically. Sometimes they're worried about having to pay bills for them. Mm -hmm. They've got kids to educate and they got to figure out what they're willing to sacrifice to do that. Cause it is a sacrifice at almost any wealth level. Mm -hmm. And they're working 50 and 60 hours a week. They're busy in the grind, whether they're business owners or, or professionals or, or, uh, or whether they're tradespeople. They're yeah. working 60, 70 hours a week. They don't have time to deal with these kinds of decisions. And if they do have some free time, they don't want to be thinking about which index fund they're in or do they have the right insurance or do they have the right estate plan? They want somebody to handle it. Yeah. Just make sure I'm okay. It boggles my mind how many people are not reasonable with the fact that their bills continue when their job stops. Like they don't get, they don't continue. They, they grow. Right. It, and you have to have car insurance to keep your car on the road. You have to have electricity to be warm and, you know, to, in, in some cases to help out with your health and you have to have a cell phone uh, you know, for emergencies. Now when you're out, it's like, the, these bills continue on, even though your mortgage is maybe gone and sat and, and settled, uh, maybe, you there know, are people, you, have, there are you people, haven't even gone on vacation. No, well, and there are people <laughs> who lose their homes, even though there's no mortgage on them because real estate taxes have gone up so much. Right. There are people who can't afford to stay in their house because of the taxes, even though they own it free and clear. Mm -hmm. that, that's especially prevalent in like Chicago area. Yeah where property taxes have gone so crazy in Illinois right. that people who've, who worked their whole lives and paid off their homes can't afford to stay in them. That's right. tragic. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's just not okay. It's not. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I understand the need for, well, tax people like to call it revenue. Right. Uh, I understand the need for taxes. I understand the need to fix potholes and to make sure roads are safe and, and to, to do the things that we need, infrastructure, fire and safety and all these things. But the amount of money we blow on stupid stuff yep. and the way in which we finance, anytime there's a dollar surplus, we figure out how to spend it three times and make it the spending annual. It's, it's, if, 
the, the thought that you think you can trust the government to balance the budget, thus driving tax base down over years is insane. You should never trust the government. They're going to balance this budget perfectly. And then all, and then all of a sudden your property taxes going to go down because now we're so equally, we're, we're so equal. It's, it, you know, government is about favors and nepotism and trying to keep people in power and them trying to earn money. And it's like that costs money and uh -huh. they will spend money to the end where they can get reelected. And it's, it is not about, uh, frankly, I don't even think this is a political point. I think this is a human point. Like, it's just what happens when people are in charge of, of wow. things where there's no, there's no real accountability. Uh, there's no real immediate accountability, like getting fired. So, you know, um, so this budget yeah. can just be completely blown out. Well, it's, it's, we could do a whole show just on that. And I think we should, but I, I want to do it later in the day so I can have a single malt while we're doing that show. Um, That's right. When we start talking about gov government, couldn't run a bake sale efficiently. Mm -hmm. Look at the post office. Yeah. The post office is, is a monopoly. Yeah. The post office should be printing money. Most, it's talking about printing the money. Most, <laughs> the most secure. They're a monopoly. Uh -huh. You look at the, you look at Amtrak, which government largely took over and destroyed. Oh, uh -huh. The government runs nothing well, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing efficiently, nothing well. That doesn't mean there aren't some good people in government, right. especially at the local and state level. Yeah. But but the fact that there are some good people, they run into this machine that just won't move. And it is all about power. You know, even Congress, Congress was designed to be a volunteer role where you would leave your family and your job and your business to go do public service and then go back to your family and your job <laughs> right. and your business. Now your only job is getting into office and staying in office and most of it's fundraising. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's bastardized beyond repair. It really I will, is. I will never forget. And here in Massachusetts, there was one whole train line shut down for like a week and it derailed. And in the same week, a price increase was set to go up on the train. Ooh. And I was thinking, well, in any business, until they fix the problem, they hold off usually on a price increase. <laughs> like most, most businesses are not going to say, hey, look, uh, you know, our tiller, we have a landscape business. Our tiller machine is broken. We can't till your lawns. Um, but, but we're gonna also going up on the price um, until we can come back. Like I've never heard of anything like this before. Um, get used to get used to it. Yeah, that's that's the that's the new paradigm. It is, Eric. I'm going to have you back on. Um, I got to end it now. We'll go three three and a half hours. Um, we'll go into into bur my bourbon time. Um, yeah, no, it, it's almost it's it's beer o'clock somewhere. Dub, double oaked uh, Woodford Reserve is, is kind of my favorite Ooh. these days. If you're buying, I'm flying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are close enough. Uh -huh. um, where can uh, individuals who are small business owners, entrepreneurs uh, listening to this podcast, um, reach out to you so that they can uh, perhaps engage you if they need the sort of advice and planning that we've spoke about today. Um, our, our resources are available at brotmanmedia.com and that's the books and the podcasts and the courses. Um, the company is BFG Financial Advisors and that's found at bfgfa.com and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. And I, there will be links, um, to um, the Brotman Media Group and uh, BFA, BFG um, in the link to this podcast and this this YouTube video. And if you're watching and listening to this, I am going to have, I am one of those podcast hosts who like conversation and hitting on multiple topics. So I tend to have multiple repeat guests because I think that, you know, there's so much to talk about when it, we haven't even talked about wealth management. Um, and I think that's important. Um, especially when we're addressing small business owners here oh, yeah. uh, who are, their goal is to build wealth. Um, and that's a whole nother su subject in and of itself. But um, so I'd love to have you back on to talk about that. Anytime. I'd love it. This was, this was fun. And I do think we should, I think we should hammer the politicians a little together. I don't even know what's, <laughs> I don't even know what side of the equation you're on. It doesn't matter because they're all yeah. terrible. We should probably have some fun at their expense. Exactly. I think, <laughs> I think, um, um, as I answer your question, I'm heterodox. So I don't really belong to either side. There, there you I, go. I will say Art. that um, I will say that you're right. The, yeah. the most inefficient of everything I've ever seen in my life. Uh -huh. um, so that means that Kim Kardashian will be president in 2024. 
she's not going to do worse than what we've had lately. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. It is yeah. just a popularity contest now, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Eric, thank you for coming on. And um, I look forward to our next chat, which we will schedule. Sounds good, Mike. It's been fun. Thanks.